Hey everybody, it's your old pal Josh. And for this week's SYSK Selects, I've chosen How Pinball Works, one of my all-time favorite episodes. And it was recorded in September of 2014, which seems like just yesterday, doesn't it? Well, at any rate, this episode has it all. Weird history, electrodynamics, uh, the tilt sign, everything. So I hope you enjoy it in good health. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark with Charles W. Chuck Bryant. And there's Jerry. This is Stuff You Should Know, the podcast. What was that? Pinball? It was the news sound? desk. Oh. I, yeah, I thought you were making pinball pings and no bells and whistles. No. <laughs> Sounds like Vegas. Vegas is like one big pinball machine. <laughs> it is, now that you've mentioned You walk it. through those casinos. Yeah, you just made my neck muscles tighten. Oh, man. I hate Vegas. I like Vegas. Yeah. I, I, would, kinda, I, would, I don't, I don't want to live in Vegas or like go to Vegas every weekend or anything like sure. that. But going to Vegas once a year, once every couple of years, that's fine with me. Yeah, not for me. Man. I mean, I've been a bunch and I'm just, I'm done. Oh, you're done with Vegas. That's what you're saying. Here. I don't see any reason to go back. I guarantee somebody you want to see will have some sort of residency out there, and you will be <laughs> back in Vegas. When I'm like 60? Sure. Yeah. Like pavement will have a residency right, exactly. in Bally's. <laughs> That's exactly, I think, what's going to happen. Well, then you'll find me living in Vegas, my friend. There you go. Yeah. See, I got you back on the Vegas train. But that sound, yeah, it's like a million pinball machines that take your money. <laughs> Yeah, faster than pinball machines. Yeah, and that was a, an early worry about pinball, actually, as we will soon see. Because I say, Ooh. Chuck, let's dive right into the history of pinballs. Yeah. So pinball machines uh, actually find their lineage back in the 19th century. There were um, things called, um, or what were they? I want to say baguette machines, but that's not correct. The bagatelle table? Yes, the bagatelle table. Thank you. Um, they were basically uh, a cross between pool and pinball. And you used a pool cue and everything, and they sucked. And nobody liked them. I think, is, I think it looks pretty cool. Does it? It looks old-timey yeah. and boring to me. Well, I mean, yeah. It's, if you're used to uh, modern gaming, then right, the bagatelle table is not going to thrill you. But I, th- I th- thought it looked kind of neat. So the bagatelle table was there. It was in place. And uh, in the 1830s, a guy named Montague Redgrave came along. Like, you can't not say that guy's name like that. No. Um, he came along and said, you know what? People just invented a spring. How do you say his name again? Montague Redgrave. <laughs> like he's on Ladonum. Yeah. Um, and uh, he came along and said, somebody invented a spring recently. I'm going to add it to this bagatelle table. Yeah. Make it less sucky. And then all of a sudden we have the uh, the... What did he call it? The ball shooter. Yeah. Which makes sense. Sure. That's what you'd call it. And now we had the first introduced mechanism of pinballs. Things are starting to take shape a little bit here. Yeah, but you didn't uh, stick a coin in the game. What you would do is, kind of like pool tables these days at a bar, you would go up to the keeper of the balls and say, here's some money, give me my balls, and let me go play the game on the bagatelle table. Yeah, and the guy would be like, hates. he would go, you know it sucks, don't you? <laughs> and you would say, yes, but it's the 1830s. So. Yeah, and if I play really well, then I can win free drinks and cigarettes. <laughs> I know. And they said, exactly. Yeah. Can't you see little 12-year-olds winning cigarettes and then going back to play more bagatelle? Sure. So it, this is the way it went for many decades. People were miserable until the 1930s. <laughs> and there was this enormous explosion of innovation and pool tablery um, in the 30s. Yeah. Like, just almost everything that you think of when you think of a pool, a pool, um, we've been saying, I've been saying pool table. Just for the last, like, minute. Why didn't you correct me? (laughs) I thought you were talking about pool tables. No, I'm talking about (laughs) pinball. Anyway, in the 30s, there was a huge explosion in pinballery. Pinballery, yeah. And um, everything that you think of when when you think of a pinball machine Almost all of it came about in the 30s. Yeah. Coin operation. Sure. The back glass. 
the thing that has like uh, Kiss or Hugh Hefner on it or something like that. that yeah. Stands up off of the playing field, the table. Yeah. Um, electric. Uh, well, I guess an electric current running through it. Yeah. Legs. Sure. Um, the tilt mechanism. Yeah. Bumpers. Yeah. Uh, sounds. Yeah. Scorekeeping. <laughs> And then bumpers, most, of course. I think I said bumpers, did I not? I don't know, maybe. But bumpers. And then most of all, most importantly, Chuck was uh, uh, the '30s led to a huge surge in popularity because you had the Great Depression and pinballs were cheap entertainment that yeah, were wide, yeah. widely available. You notice the one thing we didn't say though, and all that innovation. What flippers? Because still, up until 1947, you just bumped the thing to make the ball move. Yeah. There were no flippers. No. Which seems very counterintuitive to pinball. And the flippers really changed things. They fundamentally changed pinball. Heck yeah. Not just in the way you play, but in pinball as a game. Because before flippers, it was a game of chance. It was the same thing as playing like um, high-low, basically. Yeah. Uh, Like you had no way, really, of manipulating the movement of the ball. Well, you shake the machine. You could, but... Without tilting. I mean, that's what you did. Yeah. That was how you did it. Even still, it, 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 the amount of skill it took was minute compared to the skill that could be used once flippers were introduced. Pinball wizardry. And it became a game of skill. Yeah. Um, and then, but before that, the like I said, things were popular. Get this. Um, in the early 30s, there were 145 companies making pinball machines. And the field became so competitive and ruthless that by the mid-30s, like five years later, yeah. there were 14. Yeah, and most of those uh, were based in Chicago, which became sort of the pinball capital of the world. Yep. And I've never been there, but I bet you anything Chicago still has a lot of a lot more pinball machines than elsewhere. You Don't know, you I was trying to think of, I, like, this researching this made me want to go play pinball. Like, researching sushi made me want to go eat sushi. And I was thinking, like, I have no idea where to go to play pinball. You know, we'll go to my brother's house. Does he have one? He's got three. Oh, I love your brother <laughs> even more now. Dude, he built a whole game room, of course, because that's what my brother does. What does he have? He has a, F, uh, he has a Tomcat F-14, mm-hmm. which is the ripoff of Top Gun. I've seen that one. He said there's a lot, there were a lot of ripoff games for a while of movies and actual movie tie-in games. Yeah. Uh, he has Black Hole, but not the movie. <laughs> Just an, another ripoff game. Okay. I would Black love Hole. that one, too. Uh, and those are both kind of old school. And then he has uh, Jurassic Park, which is uh, newer. I think, doesn't that have like a T-Rex that comes down and like eats your ball? I can't remember. I I've, feel I've like played it all does. three of them. But yeah, and he also, get this, he took an old um, video game, like stand-up video game console, mm-hmm. and removed all the guts, got a uh, computer screen and um, computer and hooked it up in there to where you can play all the old school games, you know, those programs they have now. Yeah. And change the screen vertically so it just looks like a regular arcade game. And you can go up and play Frogger and Space Invaders. Oh, man. And <laughs> Scott, <asteroids>. invite me <laughs> over. Please. And it's all free. That's so awesome. It's man, he's fun. like um, Ricky Schroeder and Silver Spoons or something, but grown up. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and I think the reason why I don't play more pinball over there is because um, we're always playing ping pong. Yeah, that's a game of skill. And I love ping pong. But I'll, I'll try and get in a pinball game. Man, I, I want to play some pinball so bad. Let's just go out to Roswell, dude. Okay. We can do it right now. Uh, and I, if, I, if I collected pinball machines, it would definitely be mid, uh, mid-70s mid and mid-80s for me, yeah, I would think. the heyday. Yeah. The, you know, all the bells and whistles and all that, the newfangled bells and whistles, they're fine. That's cool. Yeah. But uh, I like uh, not so old that it's like electromechanical, yeah. but not so new that it's like nothing but like um, you know, plasma screens and stuff like that. Well, Somewhere my, in the middle. Sure, sure. I, I'm the same way. Uh, my favorite game... Of all time, pinball-wise, um, favorite game ever, Galaga. But uh, favorite game, uh, pinball-wise, was Adam's Family Pinball. Yeah. And then I learned in this article that is the top-selling game of all time from 1991. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think it was uh, either Bally or Williams uh, put that one out, and they sold more than 20,000 units of it. Dude, it's awesome, and it didn't surprise me. Like, I have no affinity for the Adams Family, but it's the best pinball game I've ever played, and when I saw it was number one, I was like, well, of course it is, because it's the best one. You don't like the Adams Family? 
No, I mean, I like it fine, but I don't. It's, I didn't play it because of the movie. I got gotcha. you. I played it because it was an awesome pinball game. I got gotcha. you. And they had one at the mall, not the mall, the bowling alley near me in Athens. Bowling alley. That's where I could probably go find a pinball machine, huh? Yeah, I'll maybe. I bet I could. Or maybe not, sadly. I'm starting a quest. All right. Um, so, telling you, let's go to my brother's house because we can have a scotch. Okay. Uh, so Got anyway, <laughs> 1947 is when they finally invented the flipper. Uh, D. Gottlieb Company introduced a game called Humpty Dumpty, and that was where what most people say the first modern game came about. Right. It took it had the little flippers. All of the innovations of the 30s and added flippers, and boom, you got pinball. Not pool, table, pinball. Pretty much. Um, uh, although the flippers weren't the same. It was um, in the 1950s, the same person in, uh, came up with spot bowler, and that was the first modern arrangement of flippers. Right, and they were longer with that introduction. Yeah, I think or so. Or else a little later on, the, fir- the first flippers they introduced were... Um, they were uh, shorter. Yeah, and they didn't face this. They f- faced in reverse of the way they face now, which uh-huh. is weird. Yeah. It was like a... They were working it out. Yeah. Beta. Pretty much. So it's funny that they introduced flippers in 1947 because 1947, by the time flippers came around, pinball was illegal in most of the major cities in the United States um, and had been for several years. I, I never. I think I had heard this once and forgotten it. Yeah. But pinball was totally outlawed because they equated it to gambling because it was not a game of skill, which it, and I guess because you got prizes. Yeah, um, Mayor LaGuardia, um, who you'll remember from the Burlesque podcast, was a bit of a moralist. Although he was a wet politician, he was in favor of repealing prohibition. He hated pinball. Hated it. He he thought it was a mafia racket. He thought that it robbed the quote pockets of school children in the forms of nickels and dimes given yeah. to them as lunch money. And he got it outlawed in New York. And once it was outlawed, he ordered like really dramatic raids. Yeah, right after Pearl Harbor, he said, "You know what we need to do? <laughs> the Japanese have just bombed us. We need to get rid of these pinball machines." Yeah. And so let's go round them up. Uh, like in a raid style, let's smash them with sledgehammers and let's dump them in the river. <laughs> That's what they did. <laughs> they dumped them in the river after they smashed them. That's a very New York 1940s thing to do. <laughs> right, exactly. I, I, I bet you there's still pinball machines down there mm-hmm. if anyone's brave enough to get into the East River. I don't think they are. No. Uh, we should say also, uh, give a shout out to Popular Mechanics who um, were working off, a, in part, a really awesome article. They came up with 11 things you didn't know about pinball history. Yeah. Um, so from the 40s until the mid-1970s, if you wanted to play pinball in New York City and Chicago and L.A., most cities in the U.S., it yeah. was illegal, um, you had to go to a pornography shop, basically, and go behind a curtain and play pinball. <laughs> Isn't that weird? It's the weirdest thing that we've ever said on this show. Until the mid-1970s. <laughs> and, like, there were still raids and pinball operators yeah. went to jail. Like me, dude, pinballs. little five-year-old Chuck. Yeah. I would have had been dropped off at a porn shop to play pinball. Hmm. Which I'm sure your parents would have been happy to do. Well, they did. And I played pinball. I didn't look at nudie people. Did you really? No, of course oh, not. Oh, I was going to say, man, you just blew my mind. No, no, no. And get this, the city of Oakland, yeah. Oakland, California, Oaktown. just this past July, overturned an 80-year ban on pinball. Free the pinballers. Yeah. Good for them. Yeah. So, uh, pinball's banned. People are still playing it like crazy. Yeah. Um, and apparently the manufacturers realize this as well, because they're still innovating and adding and making new games and machines and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, well, this is uh, after World War II, though, where things really slowed down, obviously because of the war effort. Pinball right. was, a uh, big dent was put in pinball manufacturing, too. Yeah. Like everything else. And then after the 50s, it took off again. And it also became um, kind of a symbol of rebellious youth in this Popular Mechanics article points out, like, the Fonz yeah. played a lot of pinball. I never considered that. From Tommy, um, from the Who's Tommy? Yeah. The Pinball Wizard and Tommy, both kind of yeah. rebellious, like, stick it in your ear, LaGuardia. Yeah, I mean, it seems silly now to think about that, but when Tommy came out, it was illegal, so pinball was sort of uh, 
yeah, I guess it was just the rebels. Yeah, you're anti-authoritarian if you played pinball. It was just an image of it. Yeah, and then the great Simpsons quote, uh, Sideshow <laughs> Bob said, television has ruined more young minds than pinball and syphilis combined. Right. <laughs> I, that one flew right over my head when I heard it the first time. I just thought, oh, well, that's silly, pinball. Right. But I didn't think about, like, moral turpitude. Yeah, I didn't get that one either. Yeah, but um, I do now. So luckily, pinball was still widely available, albeit in the backs of pornography shops. Um, and the reason we say luckily is because somewhere along the way, a young man, I think in his early 20s, named Roger Sharp, who was a magazine editor, um, was called upon to save the pinball world at a New York City Council meeting. Yeah, they finally said, hey, City Council, can we get a hearing on pinball machines? You guys are being ridiculous. Because it's a bicentennial of this country, and we need pinball. It's a, as American as America gets. Yeah. As pornography. <laughs> so they said, sure, we'll have a hearing, uh, because they, their intent was to prove that it was a game of skill and not chance, which was the whole rub in the first place. Yeah. So they brought in their pinball wizard. Game of chance is gambling. Sure. LaGuardia had a point. Well, sort of. I still don't get it. But this law was obsolete because they added flippers, and now it was a game of skill, but the law was still around. Yeah, basically. So they brought in their pinball wizard, Sharp, and... Um, they brought two machines because if one broke down, they wanted to have a backup. Yeah. And some jerk councilman, when he went to play the game, said, no, 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 no. Why don't you play the other game? The backup one. Yeah, the backup game. And Sharp started sweating because he was like, oh, I'm not very good at that game. Yeah, he'd I'm, never I'm, played it before. Yeah, I'm a master at this one. But he was a pinball wizard, so I believed in him. Yeah, well. Even though I didn't know it happened. Did you did you see the um, the documentary Special When Lit? No. Oh, my God. It has footage of this oh, happening. Wow. It's amazing. An amazing documentary. Yeah. All about pinball. I mean, all about pinball. is not so awesome documentary. I think there's one called Tilt as well. There is. That's about a specific moment in history in oh, okay. pinball. I haven't seen that one, but it sounds pretty good, too. Yeah. But see Special When Lit. Amazing. Gotcha. Um, and see Tilt, too. It's, what's the deal? <laughs> so um, Roger Sharp's playing. He's not really impressing anybody. And things are kind of going bad. Yeah. And he decides to do a Babe Ruth call. <laughs> he pulls back the plunger, and before he releases it, he goes, I'm going up the middle aisle here. Yeah, and just so you know, if you've never seen a pinball game, you, you pull the plunger, it shoots the ball up the right-hand side through a trough, and then it, it spits it out at the top. And what he was trying to prove is where I'm going to spit it out and where it's going to start its descent back to me is going to be in a very specific place in the center of the board. Yeah. Up not the, on the left, not on the right. Right up the middle. Yeah. And um, he did it. And apparently right afterward, the city council was like, okay, we'll repeal it. Like, it's obviously a game of skill. Yeah. Like, Roger Sharp single-handedly, well, double-handedly, because he was using the flippers. <laughs> yeah. Um, s save pinball from yeah. illegality. I wonder if they said... Yeah, fine. Good Lord. Just, it's legal. Get those machines out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Get this loser out of here. But he is not a loser because he is currently still the number 536th ranked player in the world. I'm surprised. I thought he went on to be, I think at the time he was number one, which is why they chose him. He probably was, but he's been falling ever since. Man, that's another thing in special win lit. Oh, man. There are some like really good pinball players. Well, I've got the list. Uh, I'll quickly go over the top five. Number one in the world as of today, 2014, August, whatever it is, uh, Keith Elwin of the USA is number one. USA. Uh, Jorian Ingelbrechtsen of Sweden is number two. Sweden. Zach Sharp. Recognize that name? That sounds vaguely familiar. Roger Sun. Yeah. He's the number three player in the world. That's awesome. Uh, number four, Daniele Celestino uh, Axiari. <laughs> what was that? He's Italian. He's number oh, okay. four. Uh, Jorgen uh, Holm is also Swedish. He's number five. There's a Canadian at six, a Swede at seven, then eight through 20, save one, are all Americans. Wow. -y. And uh, number 20 is Josh Sharp. So his sons followed in his footsteps. That's great. And are both top 20 ranked players. That's good. And I bet Josh is super jealous of Zach. Maybe maybe Josh is also he's like uh, I'm I want to be a veterinarian so <laughs> I'm paying more attention to that kind of thing maybe so um, so pinball was saved by Roger Sharp hooray and um, 
pinball just kept going on and on. Apparently, it had its golden day age. Um, it's widely believed between 1948 and 1958, but it was also huge in the 70s, huge in the 80s, and then video games came along. Yeah, and all of a sudden, pinball was like, uh oh, and it started to decline. Sure, and decline and decline and decline. And all, I think we were down to maybe five major. Uh, pinball machine producers. Yeah. And by major, I mean the only ones. Yeah. Um, there aren't by, any minor, minor uh, pinball manufacturers. No, because, I mean, it's all, it takes a lot of sure. time and effort to manufacture a functioning yeah, good money. pinball game. Yeah. yeah. So um, by the 90s, there were just a couple left. Everybody was selling off their pinball divisions, and there was a company called Bally Williams, which were former competitors that had merged. And this is what the documentary Tilt is about. They went to their pinball division and said, hey, you guys are great in the pinball world, but the pinball world sucks. We want more money out of you guys. What are you going to do? Uh, was that Pinball 2000? Yes, they came up with Pinball 2000. They yeah. said, we will give you a chance to save yourselves, re figure out what will revive pinball for the 21st century. And they came up with Pinball 2000. Yeah, it's basically a hybrid of uh, video gaming and pinball where you have a kind of a standard pinball setup, but a video screen that's interactive uh, yeah. as the back um, backdrop. No. Uh, no, on the playing field too. So like holograms pop up on the on the playing board and like run away from the ball and interact with the ball. Yeah, it stinks though, and no one liked it. Have you played it? I haven't played it, but I saw videos of it, and it didn't look like fun, and no one liked it. So the thing is, is like it, the this one article I read pointed out, like it wasn't given a chance to flourish. Like the idea was great, and the fact that they pulled it off successfully was really something. Well, they built only two games, right? And I think each one had a, a few thousand production run. Yeah. Um, but there was Star Wars Episode One, which here's my theory: the reason Pinball Two Thousand went nowhere, Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> Yeah, I don't the, know about that. The other one was <laughs> Revenge from Mars. And um, you can still find those used today. Um, but despite the fact that Pinball 2000 was created, it was, it was okay as far as successes go. Um, Bal Bally Williams pulled the plug. Yeah. Which left one company, Stern. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Michael Stern, I believe, who uh, inherited his father's business. And... Um, became the only people making pinball machines in the world. Still? No. Oh, is there a new one now? Yeah, man. Oh, good. Had we been, had we been recording this two years ago, uh -huh. we would have basically been saying, like, pinball's uh, dead. It's yeah. on its last leg. There's one company making it. They've started to lay off their designers because yeah. uh, of the they economic only put out a crisis. Few games a year now. Some of those designers went on, some of the stern vets went on and founded uh, a company called Jersey Jack. And... For the first time in many, many years, there are more than one pinball manufacturer. There's two. <laughs> right, but the competition has caused Stern to go back and rehire some of the people they laid off, come up with new designs. Oh, yeah? And um, they are. Th there's a pinball renaissance, a nascent pinball renaissance, just beginning to bud that could happen. Well, pinball is definitely a, sort of an in thing now. Um, if you're super cool and you're have some money, mm -hmm. then you might have a pinball machine in your house, like my brother. Right. Um, it is uh, apparently Stern's ratio of home sales to commercial uh, sales has risen from 35% uh, to 60% of their total sales. So the market now isn't for arcades, because what are those? The market is for... The, the person who has enough money to buy a pinball machine. Yeah, I want wants a new one. You don't have to. Well, yeah, if you want a new one, it's going to cost you. But yeah. if you want like a vintage one, it's, I mean, it's 1500 still. I mean, that's a decent amount of money. Yeah. But the high, like the Adams family one's less than 5000 Oh, man, that's the one that you need in the house. Yeah. So um, I think uh, my brother actually refurbished his, uh, I think, I think I'm right. I think they weren't even that's working cool. and he was able to fix them. Very neat. Yeah. Um, yeah, I imagine you can get them for way less because these are like fully refurbished, like polished, ready to go ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of them are starting to come from overseas because the demand in vintage collectors um, items are like is rising so much that like seventy percent of them come from overseas. They're re-importing them back to America now. Uh, well, and it's big in Europe because I mean, as evidence from that top ten. Uh, 
two or three of them are European. Swedes. Swedes, look at them. So uh, we'll get into how pinball actually works right after this. All right, so we've talked a lot about the history of pinball, which is way more interesting than I thought it would be. But um, we haven't talked about the game because I assume everybody has played pinball. But if you haven't, we're going to break it down. Yeah, and it's actually it's pretty simple if you really think about it. There's two real components to the game now, ever since 1947. Flippers and the ball. Uh, yeah. Everything else is just kind of ornamentation or whatever. But to play pinball, you need flippers and a ball because the point of pinball is to score points using the ball, mm-hmm. b- bouncing off of obstacles and all that stuff, and then to prevent the ball from going down the drain using the flippers. That's right. There you go, flippers and a ball. That's right. You've got your flippers um, typically at the bottom of the play field, which is what it's called, directly above the drain on both sides. Um, a lot of games you'll see now have other flippers uh, on the upper right and upper left mm-hmm. that also do fun things, um, like flip the ball. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of times the ones at the top will flip it into the very special chamber where you can score tons of points. Yeah. But we'll get to the scoring here in a minute. Um, and you basically want to propel the ball up with your little uh, plunger, and then all the bumpers and ramps are there to score your points. And um, it makes a lot of noise. It's a lot of fun. And that's pinball. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, th- that's it. For me, this article on How Stuff Works pointed out, like, you know, when you're talking about scoring, which we'll talk about later, that's, like, doesn't mean anything to people who are playing pinball, most of us, because I'm just trying to keep the ball from going down the drain. Sure. Um, but the the way that pinball is arranged, as you get better and better at it, you'll learn that um, there are all sorts of combinations and tricks and stuff that you can do to really score some points. We'll get to that later on. I get ahead of myself. That's right. Uh, the ball itself, if you want to just talk hardware, uh, it's one and one sixteenth inches in diameter. Mm-hmm. And it's steel, and it weighs about two point eight ounces, and can reach speeds up to ninety miles an hour. When you see that thing shoot out of a one of the little uh, chambers that'll come back at you, yeah, it's going really fast. Yeah, it is. And that is um, sometimes it will use magnets underneath the table too. Because since it's a steel ball, you'll sometimes see a game that has like a like a spinning disc, like a vortex in the center of the table that will start at any given moment. And it can catch your ball and keep your ball there uh, with its magnet just sort of spinning in place. Yeah. Which is no good. Or it could be super good depending on what you're after. Uh, sometimes, though, they do use a ceramic pinball called a power ball. And it is uh, lighter and faster and immune to magnets. So... A lot of times when you'll have multi-ball going on, some of those other balls are ceramic. Yep. And that's when things get crazy. So as the ball's going around the table, um, it's hitting the bumpers, it's hitting the targets, and they're sending messages to the, um, well, if it's post-76 game, to the motherboard that's keeping track of your score and all that jazz. Yeah, and you've only got the three balls. That's, that's a game. Yes. But there are circumstances where you can get more which we'll tell later. So, Chuck, there's also another component uh, you don't have to have to play pinball, but all pinball games have it now. It's called the black box. And if you look at a pinball table, you've got the field, right? Yeah, the play field. Which is the board that has all of the bumpers and the stuff and the flippers and everything on it. And then at a right angle to that, coming off of it, you've got what's called the back glass. And connecting the two is called the black box. And this is where all of your electronics and your solid state stuff goes. Yeah, your back glass is not only going to have your scoreboard and your information, like they'll say things like aim for the aim for the canyon. You know, they'll give you hints and, and uh, little tricks along the way. Look out for the T-Rex. <laughs> Look out for the T-Rex. Um, but it's also to uh, the back glass is where like if you're walking through your arcade and it's 1983, mm-hmm. that's where you're going to see that's where your attention is going to go. So that's where you see the Playboy models on both sides of Hugh Hefner, or Kiss, mm-hmm. looking cool. Yeah. So it's a, it's sort of an advertisement. Hey, come put your quarters into me. Right. It's shiny. It's colorful. They spend money designing those things, and uh, a lot of those have become art now. Yeah. They'll remove them and uh, frame them and hang them on the wall. Right. Which would be wicked cool. I think it would be, but I'd rather have the actual pinball game. Yeah, sure. Um, so like I said, back in the 70s, they, they introduced solid-state electronics, 
Prior to that, all pinball machines were electromechanical. And at first when I was researching this, I thought like, well, okay, so solid state took over everything. That's not the case. Solid state took over basically the back class. Everything else is still yeah. electromechanical, or it was up until the very, very, very recent times, although they still might be electromechanical. So um, when you hit a bumper with your ball and it makes it like bounce and vibrate yeah. and you get some points, that's because you set an electrical impulse using an electromechanical um, assembly to the motherboard, the solid state motherboard that's keeping score. So the motherboard is now keeping score. It's um, now they can use digital sound so they could add speakers to the back glass and sure. all this stuff. But the actual function of the the pinball machine while you're playing is still electromechanical. Yeah, that's old school. Yeah. Uh, and there's about a half a mile of wiring in each one. And um, if you come over to my brother's, he will show you the guts. That's neat. He has his rigged where you can pull down the back uh, back glass. Look under the hood? Yeah, basically. And, you know, it just looks like a huge mess of wires. and Half a mile of wires. Things. That yeah. is a lot. It's pretty crazy. Um, Does he wear like a chain wallet when he works <laughs> on his pinball machine? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, so the, the play field itself, which is what everything is on, is tilted at about six to seven degrees toward you. And it is made of wood. And it's also very old school, you know. So at some point, someone makes this... Uh, like a wood base, like cornhole, and it's got holes drilled in it, and it's got stuff painted on it. Yeah, and a bunch of layers of finish uh, to keep it, you know, to protect it, and to make that ball go. Yeah, but I mean, that's basically it. It's pretty simple. Yeah, it's, some of the very newer ones, um, I guess, from the 21st century, uh, replaced the wood f- playing field with um, uh, plasma screens. Oh, really? Or uh, LCD screens? Ugh. Yeah, but uh, you know, kids today. No, thanks. Um, but other than that, it's like screws and glue and wood. It's just, it's fairly old school. Yeah. And, and still uh, like entertaining. Pinball's challenging. That's why you hate Pinball 2000, huh? It was newfangled. Yeah, totally. <laughs> like, hey, let's take something awesome and make it new for everybody. Like, I, I hate that. Uh-huh. You know? It's like taking some classic drink. Like, you're a cocktail guy. Yeah. Saying, let's add, uh, you know, let's add some some new oxygenated something to the Manhattan. You're like, no, a Manhattan's perfect. I don't know, oxygenated something. <laughs> <laughs> I just hate every, like, some things are perfect the way they are, and I think pinball's one of them. So, Chuck, you approach the pinball machine, you put yeah. your quarters in and everything, um, and you either, so you press the start button, or, well, once you press the start button, a ball should fall into the launch lane, which is the at the back of the launch lane is the plunger. Yes. In some of the newer games, there's a solenoid which shoots it for you. Yeah, I've seen other things a like a like a gun handle trigger and stuff oh, instead yeah. of the plunger. Very clever. But again, I'm into the the old you like school. the plunger. Sure. Sure. Um, it, uh, one way or another, you're going to launch the ball. The advantage of a solenoid that launches it for you or with the press of a button is that if you are playing a game and you're pretty good yeah. and the pinball machine decides it wants to see what kind of a wizard you are, sure. it will send more balls into action. The way it does that these days is by using a solenoid. Yeah. Uh, in olden days before the solenoid, say the 80s, um, There's a little man inside. <laughs> well, you had to pull the plunger back yourself. Yeah. And that meant you had to take your finger off of a flipper button, which oh, yeah. meant, hey, man, you better be quick. I kind of forgot about that. Or you're dead. Yeah. That's why solenoids, that's the advantage they have. Yeah, I'll take that um, uh, advancement. That passes my bar. Okay. The solenoid is good. So let's talk about actual pinball play after this message, Chuck. Ding, ding. Stuff you should know. Okay, scoring in pinball, like you said earlier, if you're a regular schmo like us, yeah. we're just trying to keep that ball yeah. on the table. But if you are a pinball wizard, then that means you know the game within the game and all the combination shots that you're specifically trying to hit in order to rack up the big, big, big points. This is nuts to me. I have to tell you, I didn't even know that this existed until oh, this really? article. Yeah. Oh, I knew. I just, you know. Like, I'm that's how poor wizard. my pinball playing is. No, I'm I'm not any good either. But you you is your brother good? So you've seen him? He's yeah, he's better than me. So they they use this um, in this article. They use the example of a game called High Roller 
pinball. Yeah. And basically, imagine this. While you're playing high roller, um, you basically want to knock out some icons that are associated with poker. Yeah. Once you've hit all the icons with the ball or something like that, so they're tiles that you knock down or whatever, once you've hit them all, you've unlocked a game within a game. Yeah. And I think it starts with poker. And all of a sudden, you're playing pinball while you're also playing poker on the back glass. Yeah, so like you're trying to hit a specific thing that will give you a specific card in a poker hand, let's say. Right. And... Like you have to be, you know, you have to, you're trying to do this with your flipper. It's a game of skill, like we said. Right. But at the same time, you're still playing your pinball game too, right? Well, I mean, it's part of the game. So like, you know, you'll know you've got the cards up on the back glass and right. you'll say, all right, I got to hit that bumper yeah. to get a king. Gotcha. So I'm, I'm aiming for that king the whole time. Okay. So if your brain hasn't melted yet, <laughs> prepare for the finish. Once poker's done, there's like four or five other casino games that you play after that. Yeah. And you play them in succession. And and as you win them, you get closer and closer to this um, special play mode called Casino Frenzy. That's what it's called in the um, high roller machine. Yeah. That's after you've won all the game, the poker games. Right. Yeah. Not, but yeah, it's all the games. Yeah, yeah. And so you're playing Casino Frenzy, and that's what's called a wizard award, where it's like, okay, this kid's good. Yeah. Now we're going to really let him or her sure. uh, up their points by playing a special round. And all of a sudden, the field is like flooded with balls, and every bumper you hit is worth like hundreds of thousands of points, and it's just scary and terrifying. Yeah, multiball is... is stressful yeah for a guy like me <laughs> same here man i just try and keep you know what happens to me in multi-ball is i usually lose them all pretty quickly like i can't even hold on to the one because it just it stimulates me too much i'm like what what right, happened right yeah and me too and i'm like as long as i've got one i i'm i'm break even but with um with wizard award functions um that's when you start to earn even more points. But imagine having like three, four, five balls on the field. Yeah. And the computer in the machine is telling you like, hit this combination and we'll give you like 20 million points. Yeah. And um, if you're even in Wizard Award ball, you're a pretty good pinball player, I would imagine. For sure. And that's just the high roller game. But most games have a, a couple of games within the game that you should look out for. And um, that's how you get your free game. If you've ever... Uh, lucked up or been super good mm -hmm. and gotten, um, you know, they'll tell you on the back glass how much uh, you have to have, like replay value 30 million. Um, and that's what you're shooting for because you want to get that free game, not just because it's a, a quarter or whatever, right? but because it's like a big award, you know, it's like entering your name on the, um, in, in the top 10 in Galaga. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't understand this. When you get a free game, is that like three free balls or one extra ball? I think it's three. I think it's a full free game. That would make sense. That's why they call it And it, it keeps a free tallying. Game. It doesn't like reset. Right. Yeah. You can also fall backwards into a free game with something called match. Where yeah, I had never heard of this. Every once in a while, the computer will just flash like a random number between, uh, what, zero, zero, and 90, I think? Yeah, a multiple of 10. And um, if the last two digits of your score at that moment happen to match that number, then you win a free game. It's like a little lotto game. Yeah. And I think I've gotten a free game that way because I remember getting free games before, but being like, how did I get a free game? Right. I, must have, on? <laughs> I must have hit the match. You like just turn into Christopher Walken in the dead zone. <laughs> uh, I saw that not too long ago. That holds up. Yeah, it does. Um, but as far as replay goes, it says that most machines are set, so you have to be in the top 10% to get a replay. And you can get a second replay, but they have it um, maxed out at 150% of the first. So a double replay is tough. Yeah. I mean, you're Tommy at that point. Or your last name is Sharp. Yeah, I guess so. Um, and then Tilt. Chuck, you know, tilt. Yeah. It's synonymous with pinball. Tilt is where you are being, well, basically where you've been punishing the machine, the machine says, enough. Yeah. Hands off, man. And basically, like we were saying, early pinball machines, um, the only way you can manipulate them before the flippers was to move the machine. Yeah, kind of bump it. So the tilt mechanism has been in place to prevent people from overly cheating by tilting the machine. By It's really old-timey contraption, and I guess it's still in use. I know, it's pretty funny how old-school it is. Basically, they have, like I guess, like a copper, copper wire 
with a um, circle on the end, a ring on the end, and dangling in the ring but not touching it is like a metal ballast, yeah. right? And it's connected to the machine. So as long as the ballast is just swinging around freely within the ring, you can tilt as much as you like. Yeah, and a skilled player knows how to tilt without getting caught. Right. It's part of the game. Yeah. But once you tilt too far and the metal ballast touches the copper ring, a current is formed. Yeah. And all of a sudden it sends that to the motherboard and the motherboard says, tilt. This is your first warning. And apparently most modern games give you two warnings and then you, the flippers stop working and you lose your ball. Yeah. And that's just losing one ball. If right. you really get upset, if your ball is stuck or if you're just having a bad day at the office and you pick up the front of the machine and slam it down, <laughs> that's called a slam tilt. And they have these little leaf switches uh, inside the machine for that. And if they touch each other, that means you have really taken things too far. And that is shut it down, no game. Yeah. Not we're taking your ball. They're saying leave the machine. You're not going to win any cigarettes doing that. Exactly. And that's the uh, that's the slam tilt. That's pinball, baby. Yeah, I got nothing else. I don't either. This is very exciting. I'm glad we finally did it. It's been on my list forever. Ever oh, really? since I found out it was illegal. <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh, I got to get into that. But that was like a couple years ago, I feel like. Wow. Yeah, when I saw Special Win Lit. Nice. Man, everybody, go see that. Is that on the old Netflix? I believe it is. Tilt definitely is. All right. I think Special Winlet might be, too. I'll add that to the former queue, which they had to change because Americans are dumb. What do they call it now? It's not called a list because people are like, what's a queue? Really? <laughs> Why is it spelled like that? I hadn't noticed <laughs> that they did that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I've heard that's the reason. It makes sense to me. I can't yeah. verify that, though. Uh, well, if you want to learn more about pinball, go check out Special Win Lit. Go check out Tilt. Check out the popular mechanics article we mentioned, 11 Things You Didn't Know About Pinball History. It's pretty awesome. And, of course, check out the uh, article on HowStuffWorks.com. Go to the search bar and type in pinball, and it will bring up this article. Since I said search bar, it's time for listener mail. Uh, yeah, this is via Facebook, actually, um, in regards to our Morgellons podcast, because one <laughs> of our... Is that funny? <laughs> I think it's Morgellons, but... <laughs> you are literally the only person on the planet that calls it that. Fine. Um, Tyler Murphy, our, uh, one of the generals in the Stuff You Should Know Army, and Facebook and email friend... Uh, pinged, I guess, a doctor friend of his named Chris Wells and was like, hey, dude, check this out. Do you know anything about this? And so he commented on there. I was like, hey, this is a listener mail. Can I use it? And he said, yes. So he says he's only come across it twice. Uh, in both cases, they brought stuff in telling me it was eggs and bugs. I, along with my med technologist, reviewed it under a microscope, and it was mainly lint and hair follicles. Mm -hmm. uh, one had some insight that it was not an actual infection and felt relieved. The other was very upset that I suggested otherwise. So he kind of got both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Uh, I would never treat um, with an antiseptic, I'm sorry, antiparasitic med if I didn't think it was a real infection. The risk of causing harm versus fixing anything uh, is too high. Uh, antiparasitic meds can have all kinds of unwanted effects from kidney and liver impairment to lowering the threshold for seizure to potentially being carcinogenic themselves. Uh, for every case of monsters inside me on TLC that goes undiscovered and later is found to truly have a parasitic infection, there are many more where there is no physical evidence of infection because there's simply not one. Uh, you feel really crappy as a physician, though, when you have to tell someone that everything they brought into your office is all dust and lint, that there is no physical evidence for their ailments. The most important thing for a clinician to remember is that even if this is all in their head or imagine or however you want to word it, the patient is still experiencing it, which is what we pointed out. Yeah. Uh, so you need to try and treat the root cause, whether it be with... Uh, continued reassurance and second opinion within reason or uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or other means. And that is Chris Wells via our buddy Tyler Murphy. Cool. Thanks, guys. Who uh, Tyler's a teacher, and in the summertime, he works at the big putt-putt chain. Putt-putt? No, nah, it's, it's like the big uh, adventure land or what I can't remember what it's called. Huh. Pir Pirate's Cove. Is that a chain? I don't know. It sounds like a chain. Anyway, that's what he does. It just sounds like fun. It's like, man, I could totally do that job oh, in yeah. the summers. That'd be fun. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much, you guys. And uh, anyone else out there who has any further clarification on any episode we've ever done, we want to hear from you. You can 
tweet to us at SYSK Podcast. You can join us on Facebook.com slash Stuff You Should Know. You can send us an email to StuffPodcast at Discovery.com. And as always, go check us out at our home on the web, StuffYouShouldKnow.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. HowStuffWorks.com.